Welcome to FT Data Center. Drew here. As data center facility specialists, we sometimes feel a little like we operate in a vacuum. Like nobody really cares about our work, except now there's one TV show that is basically all about data center infrastructure. Today, we're talking about Mr. Robot. First of all, huge spoiler warning. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, let's start with episode zero, hellofriend.mov. In this episode, Elliot is tasked with stopping a DDoS attack on Evil Corp servers. Elliot actually has to physically fly out to the data center to fix it. Why would you fly to the data center in order to stop a DDoS attack? Even if you don't have network connectivity, you don't handle real-time attacks in person because you have feet on the ground with whom you could teleconference a walkthrough. Flying takes time, but teleconferencing is instantaneous. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Yet I'll totally allow it because this is Elliot we're talking about. Dude works in mysterious ways and obviously is able to convince people to do insane things. Check. So when Elliot gets to the Evil Corp data center, it's a messy mixture of servers and racks that looks like it's been assembled by a maniac. This is really what data centers of huge conglomerates look like in the real world. They're messy because they've been there for 30 years. During that time, they've transitioned from mainframes all the way to modern cloud servers. And they still have everything in between sitting around. Totally accurate. Check. So while Elliot is in the data center, all the lights are off. Usually data centers are unoccupied, which means that the place stays pretty dark, but they have motion sensors, so as long as someone walks in, they're intensely bright. Here's the thing, in a really well-built data center, only the rack row that you're working in actually lights up, so even the lighting in this scene is actually pretty true to life. It might not have been accurate on purpose, but awesome, check. So there's a moment when Elliot goes to the physical server, knowing exactly where it is. In real life, server administrators in large data centers often can't find a server without searching through the database, which is often just an Excel spreadsheet. And often then, the only information is what rack server the server is in. When they get to the rack, they have to look at the label on the front of the server. Elliot, who is a contractor and not a local admin, would probably have no idea where it is. Maybe Evil Corp has a good data center infrastructure management system or configuration management database to allow him to find the server quickly. Maybe he was working there for hours and got acclimated to where everything was. I'll call this accurate, though unlikely. Also, that little screen with the circles for servers is really hard to understand. It doesn't convey very much useful information. They should fire their software vendor. So let's move on to episode one, ones and zeros.mpeg. In this episode, the team plans to break into the PLC of a power plant to blow it up, thereby disrupting the operations at the Steel Mountain Data Center. There are a lot of question marks here, like whether or not the gas explosion will actually destroy a presumably underground taped storage facility. But the main idea, hacking into a PLC to cause an explosion, has actually been shown to be plausible. In 2008, the U.S. government conducted what was called the Aurora Test, in which they hacked into the PLC that controlled the generator. By repeatedly opening and closing the output breaker out of phase with the grid, they were able to cause the generator to fault and explode, albeit without a massive fireball. But debris was strewn as far as 80 feet. So the plan is plausible. Plus, Elliot doesn't actually go through with the plan, so there's nothing factually inaccurate in the show. Big check. In episode four, exploits.wmv, Elliot hacks into Steel Mountain's control system in order to heat up the backup tapes, thereby destroying them. Let's start from the beginning to see how he breaks into the facility in the first place. An unwitting employee denies Elliot access. Then he looks at Elliot's alter ego on Wikipedia. The page said Elliot is a billionaire. The unwitting employee allows Elliot in, but with an escort and without any access rights. Okay, I can buy that. People are dumb and often awestruck by billionaires. 
In general, I've always needed to show a personal ID in order to get access to a building. And I've had to wear a name badge at all times, but again, I'm not a billionaire. I call this stretching the truth a lot. Later, Elliot installs a Raspberry Pi to control the HVAC system at Steel Mountain. Installing the man in the middle Raspberry Pi is pretty interesting. I think Elliot would have a simpler plan than splicing together the Cat 6 with electrical tape. Whatever, Elliot's a hacker. Hackers brute force things. Then, after the Pi is installed, it's not entirely implausible that Elliot could get more control of the HVAC system using the Pi, and if it's an older system, it becomes much more plausible. Many older systems have almost zero security on the input device side. However, this system looks quite new. Whatever, I'll give this one a check minus. So moving on to episode five, Brave Traveler. In this episode, Elliot breaks Vera out of jail by hacking the prison PLC. I don't have any knowledge of prisons, but I do understand PLC design and the inherent problems with building automation technologies. Newer technologies are really fantastic, but only so long as the firmware is updated. Many of these controllers run on legacy operating systems that are behind firewalls that don't allow unsigned downloads. That means that you can't run system updates to get the latest security patches for that building automation system that runs on Windows XP, which was cutting edge when it was installed in 2001. Java is also a huge culprit with its unceasing update requirements. I think there are definitely prisons out there with terrible network security, but I can't actually comment specifically. Definitely plausible, but very unlikely. In episode seven, whiterose.m4v, White Rose invites Elliot into a Faraday cage, which blocks all EM radiation. The room is shown as glass-walled. A Faraday cage requires careful attenuation of EM frequencies by using differently sized conductive grids in order to filter out any or all wavelengths, or at least those used by cell phones and Wi-Fi. You have a Faraday cage in your house, a microwave. That grill in the microwave window blocks the specific EM frequency that the microwave operates on. That's why you can look in the window without frying your brains like Dale Chipotle. That grid is very similar in dimension to one that would filter out cell phone signals because the frequencies are similar. Faraday cages can be installed in buildings, but it's a huge pain. You wouldn't use clear glass because conductive glass is expensive. However, it does exist. You can build a Faraday cage room out of glass. You'd be crazy to do so, but I'll give this a check. I mean, White Rose is a badass, so why wouldn't he build it out of glass? Now, we're gonna talk about the big one. The actual hacks that the whole series have been building towards, corrupting all Evil Corp financial information, thereby erasing all debt. Let's talk about episode eight, mirroring.qt. I'll go through a few facilities-related reasons why this is implausible. Let's start with database dependencies. In order to properly corrupt the financial data, Elliot and Darlene would need to simultaneously affect all files because databases have dependencies where one table references the data from another table. If one database references encrypted data, it would throw an error and a database administrator would notice something and try really hard to stop it. Elliot could still cause a lot of problems but he wouldn't destroy the financial system entirely, just mostly mess it up. So let's actually get into the logistics here. Any large scale financial institution in the US has more than one data center. In fact, they have several spread out across the entire world. One in New York, one in London, one in Tokyo, etc. Many times they will have redundant facilities close by so that they can maintain concurrent backups with less than four millisecond latency. We calculate the distance using empirical latencies, but here's the justification. Given the speed of light is about 300 million meters per second, and the index of refraction in a fiber optic cable slows light down to about 200 million meters per second, and transmission and mux ponder losses increase the latency even further, we tend to limit to about 60 miles to be conservative. That means that other data centers, which are more than 60 miles away, don't have concurrent backups. It could take several orders of magnitude longer to travel to a data center across the country because nobody would make 
long haul fiber with that much bandwidth. Geographically diverse data centers are often sent database images once per day. It's not possible to delete this information simultaneously. So I don't buy that they infected the entire system. Financial data is not kept on the individual server, but instead is installed in a large storage array called a storage area network, or SAN. These are huge systems that can hold petabytes and petabytes of data. They have controllers in them that essentially direct storage traffic, but they don't actually do any calculations on the data. If Elliot were to target these storage arrays, he might be able to do some real damage, but encrypting information takes processing power and time, so SAN administrator would certainly notice the intrusion and attempt to take action. Plus, SAN bandwidth is not unlimited, even if it's running at 10 gig fiber. It takes time to transfer this data to and from the server. It's very unlikely that he could destroy all the information without overloading the SAN. And even if that is the case, large financial institutions have disaster recovery data centers that store images of all servers so that if something like this hack happens, they can roll back to the original data and retrieve it. It would still be a huge disruption and would probably bring global commerce to a halt, but would not destroy debt forever. All that said, the show actually does not depict all data being erased. The only real effect is that point of sale credit card readers don't work anymore. That's very believable after a hack like this. So Elliot was wrong to think that he could erase all debt, but the show isn't wrong in depicting the effects of the hack. Last but not least, let's talk about those tapes that were shipped to five different storage facilities all over the world. Let's just, for a second, assume that Elliot was able to actually fry all the data centers as well as the disaster recovery data centers. Let's think about the tape facility. One of the most popular crack unit manufacturers in the U.S. is Emerson Network Power, formerly known and still referred to as Liebert. Liebert units operate on a network called ICOM, which is a proprietary controls package that makes units work in tandem. This system is based on an open 192.168.1.1 network without any intrinsic security. The passwords are four-digit numeric, which can be brute forced in minutes. Here's the thing. This network is never actually connected to the internet. These units are actually connected to the outside world through a different connection, which usually runs on Modbus or TCP IP. These connections have better security, and you can actually set robust passwords. However, these are often controlled by building management systems, or BMS. If you could hack the BMS, then you could conceivably mess with the crack unit set points and make the room heat up. BMS systems differ dramatically in their security. A good network administrator would segregate systems in VLANs and create a DMZ that requires VPN access and AD credentials before getting through the firewall that protects the BMS. If you are able to parse all of those initialisms, then you're probably a better network administrator than the dumbass at Steel Mountain. I could kind of imagine this happening in some alternative universe where all network administrators are painfully incompetent, which is especially possible in established industries that built their BMS 20 years ago and never bothered to upgrade. Given that Steel Mountain is a company built entirely around security, this is almost impossible. But here's the real catch. I have a really hard time believing that Elliot fried the backup tapes at all. Long-term tape storage is actually not usually in data centers. It's in a cold room with no actual equipment in it. The tapes are on shelves with little robots that grab the tapes and bring them to the tape reader when needed. That or they're stored on shelves where humans grab them and take them to the reader. Either way, there's nothing in that room that's hot. Computer room air conditioners or crack units, like those found in data center or tape backup rooms, do not tend to have heaters in them except for what's called reheat, which is intended to aid in dehumidification. They do this by overcooling the air to the dew point and then reheating it. Often the reheating element is omitted to save money and energy. Since there is no heat producing equipment and no reheat element, Elliot's plan to bake the tapes would not work. 
the only significant source of heat would be the compressors in the crack units and the lighting. So Elliot's master plan could be thwarted simply by someone turning out the lights. Global crisis totally averted. Now, I have seen tape libraries that are located in the same raised floor area as data center space, albeit in an adjacent room. If this is the case, then the servers themselves could be used to create the heat needed to fry the tapes by using the crack units to pull hot air from the ceiling return plenum into the cold raised floor and then into the tape room. So in that entirely unlikely scenario, this is possible, but so astronomically unlikely that I'm gonna have to almost definitely give it a no. So let's see where that leaves us. As you can see, Mr. Robot is pretty accurate in relation to facility systems. But you can also see how many things would have to go wrong for Evil Corp, and how many would have to go right for Elliot in order for his plans to work. His MO of attacking the facilities networks and control system is definitely a smart one. They are often the least secure pieces of the puzzle. However, at best, this would be a disruption of a few months not an internal collapse of all death. I will say that none of the events in the show contradict what I just wrote. In the finale, Evil Corp publicly acknowledge what happened, but they seem fairly optimistic that they can bounce back. There isn't complete panic in the streets, just extreme unease. Totally nailed that, Sam S. Mal. There's no reason to think that a major hack like this would bring about Armageddon. But keep in mind for next season, Debt hasn't been erased in the world of the show, but that doesn't mean that the entire world economic system hasn't gone into freefall because of the newfound vulnerability of the financial system. This hack, even as I have described with all my caveats, would easily cause a downturn to rival the Great Depression. No joke. Not joking. Thanks for the nightmares, mass email. I mean, Sam S. Mail. As always, thanks for watching, and until next time, stay centered. Brought to you by Evil Corp. There's absolutely nothing to worry about right now. To learn more, visit www. You are now part of the resistance.